so uh first of all uh welcome to something wicked docu fest thank and, you and then what we're going to do is i want you to first start off by telling our audience who you are what's your film and what you did on the film my name is mary o'leary and i was the producer director and i conceived the project Dark Shadows and Beyond, the Jonathan Fritz story. Excellent. So uh, for people who are not like me, who don't, doesn't know who Jonathan Fritz is, can you tell us a little bit about the film itself? Yes. It is about the entire life of actor Jonathan Fred, but he is best remembered for a television series that was on in the late 1960s called Dark Shadows. It was remade as a series in 1991 with Ben Cross and actually was in prime time. The original Dark Shadows was in the afternoon in a soap opera time slot, although it was far from your average soap opera. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to the 91 revival, there was a movie in 2012, which Johnny Depp starred in, Tim Burton's Dark Shadows. Um, it wasn't um, received well by the original fans of the series because they really played it for camp. In the original series, while some people watch it today and can find things humorous, it was never played for camp. The actors and the writers took it very seriously. But looking at a soap opera from the late 1960s today, of course, we see a lot of things that look very dated and in some things come across humorous. But it was absolutely taken very seriously. And much of the cast were coming from the Broadway stage. Uh, and they, they were completely professional on how they presented it every day. Um, Jonathan, after Dark Shadows, did experience being typecast. And he made some choices that surprised a lot of people, uh, some of which was to remove himself for a period of time from performing. Um, and yet it was his passion. Um, I actually met him in the mid 80s uh, as I was just at the start of my career. And he had an idea to do a one-man show. And basically, I and a few other people helped him make that happen. And it was an amazing experience for me. And uh, all these years later, I was given the opportunity to work on a documentary about his life uh, and who he was as a person. Because so many people still today, Dark Shadows, 55 years later, um, can be seen on many different. It's been on... Amazon Prime Video, it's been on Decades TV, uh, it's been seen on Tubi, many, many different places to watch it, as well as, of course, it's been on the original VHS and then to DVD and Blu-ray. So people of all ages really have seen it. And um, I wanted to give them an insight into who Jonathan was as a person. And that's what the focus of this story is, an actor whose true passion in life was the stage. And um, ultimately always went back to it. You know, his passion started at the age of 16 and lasted his whole life through when he was, uh, he passed away in 2012 at the age of 87. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> well, the, the thing I, I, and I'm gonna preface this real quick because um, my mother grew up with Dark Shadows. And so for my entire life, uh, she would always reference this. And so until the 1990 television series came out and we all as a family had to sit down and watch this show because my mother was so enamored with the original Dark Shadows. At that time, it was kind of hard to find the, 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 um, the original episodes of the show because you can only find them on VHS tapes and ran, you know, blockbusters and stuff like that. But uh, getting back to the original Dark Shadows, what happened was I loved the 1990 version of the show. And I was like, Mom, what is this show? I need to know this show you've been talking about to me for so many years that you watched as a kid as a soap opera. And that's when I fell in love with the show. I had to go up the blockbuster and find these pieced in random episodes and these uh, these these compilation episodes of random episodes that people love. I never got to see the way it was originally intended till, like you said, it came out on DVD. And I was like, man, and my brain, I've been growing up with it my whole life because my mother was always into horror stuff when uh, when I was younger. So these things she always mentioned. She always mentioned Dark Shadows because I guess that was the only horror type of show out at the time. And she would mention Stephen King stuff. And I'm like, all right, mom, it's all good. Uh, but I got to learn who I uh, who Jonathan Fridge from that was. What I liked about your film is that you showed me an entire life that I had never even heard of 
or even knew existed. Like I'm watching your film and I'm like, man, I wish I'd been around to watch some of those one man uh, shows he did. Cause I think what well, he did three different ones is. Yes, the first was called J Jonathan Frizz Fools and Fiends. And it was many short stories with a horror sci-fi bent, so Edgar Allan Poe story, Stephen King, but he also threw in some humor. So there was a humor story by James Thurber about Mr. Preble gets rid of his wife in this sort of bumbly, browbeaten husband wants to get rid of his wife. And it's very, very funny. So Jonathan <laughs> always wanted to balance. So yes, I'll give you the traditional spooky Poe story, but I want to also have you laugh a bit too, because he loved comedy. People always think of him as such a serious person. He was very, <laughs> very funny and enjoyed playing comedy. Yeah, I, I get that from your film. Now, uh, my impressions are from watching the film is that since you got to know him, <clears throat> No, when he was when you guys started doing the one man shows, you got to know him in his later life, and you probably got to know him. Uh, you know, I guess it's a renaissance, and I guess it's the best word, uh, a, a renewed interest in the live performance. And I love to hear that actors love to do live performance in in lieu of doing like the uh, the television stuff and the um, the film work all the time. Because you do mention some of his side film work. But you also uh, make it uh, very clear that he did the one man shows. He did these readings of the Edgar Allan Poe stories and stuff like that to be in front of an audience, which I think was was amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm me personally who uh, I hate to hear stories about people who get typecast and they don't, they're not they're unable to pursue their careers or out of something else afterwards. This story here was like eye-opening for me. I was, I mean, I don't even know how to, I'm like kind of dumbstruck because I don't, I, I hear so many bad stories about people getting typecast, but with your story in Jonathan and Fred's life, you show that he went to, uh, he did the, um, what was it? The, uh, do I remember the little the tours in South America or Mexico? I can't remember. South right. America. Yeah, uh, South America. He yeah. would he did those tours in South America. And uh, you know, and then he did his one man show. And I was like, oh, and he did Arsenic Old Lace, which is one of my favorite right. shows of all time. I was like, oh. that man, I wish I had seen that because that would have been hilarious. Cause I love that show. I love that show and being a theater geek. I've actually been a part of two versions of that. Not in it. I'm a tech geek. <laughs> okay, me too. <laughs> uh, 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 Jonathan has uh, much more talent than I do. I can't get on the stage and perform as well as he did. <laughs> uh, but just to hear the stories that you know, he was still able to continue doing his craft the way he wanted to after Dark Shadows is amazing because you don't hear that story enough. You don't hear the story of these uh, of these amazing actors. Who have their, their 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 time in the sun for a, a certain amount of time and they get typecast and then you don't hear about them anymore you don't know what they're doing uh -huh. and mm -hmm. uh one of the things your film did was like it was eye-opening i was like i i thank god that uh he was able to continue doing his work and seeing his fans and then of course you joining him in there and helping him do that and then doing the documentary about him so uh, yeah. <laughs> It was very fascinating when I got to meet Jonathan. And while we were very focused on getting his one man shows uh, <laughs> on the stage, um, he was a great storyteller in life. And I would ask him questions. And after Dark Shadows, you know, he really thought, all right, I'll go on and do other things. But he was getting called from his agent. All right, we want you to go do this toothpaste commercial. And he gets there and they're like, do your thing, Mr. Fred. He said, I don't have a thing. I'm an actor and I played a vampire, but in fact, he was a very multifaceted character. He had a range of emotions. I, he never thought of him as a, that he would be typed. And so after go, this agent would send him up for these things and he finally just said, enough, I'm taking a break. Mm -hmm. And he, he moved away. Uh, I was in Mexico for a year, just learning Spanish, loved the language, and came back and started to do some stage work. And then he did accept the image. He knew that he would always be remembered for Barnabas, but he said, you know, that will bring people in the door, but then I'll show them something else. I'll show them another side. And so when we work together, that's really what we were doing. Yes, let's reach out and 
ex-vampire tells spooky tales, <laughs> I'll get you in. Now you're going to see all kinds of, and he said it's fascinating to be on stage and he played every single part, whether it was a little girl or an old man. And um, <laughs> he just he loved, I mean, there's a fulfillment for an actor to be on stage. You get the sense of the audience. Are they with you? Um, are they laughing? If it's funny. And that's something that truly, I think, a true actor, you want to be there with the live audience and feel that fulfillment. And of course, you've just been through a terrible period where theaters were closed um, and actors were working on Zoom. And as much as that was wonderful, it's still, you didn't, you didn't see your audience, you couldn't feel your audience. Um, so he really just loved being up on stage and doing his one-man show. And as you mentioned, Arsenic and Olace, which he did on Broadway with an amazing cast. I mean, the other co-stars were Gene Stapleton, who knows from All in the Family, Marion Ross, who's known from Happy Days, uh, Gary Sandy was WKRP in Cincinnati, and Larry Sorch was from F Troop. So all five of the leads were known for a particular television character, but they came together. That play was so funny. They had a great time. They toured uh, for the first part of the tour is like January to June. They had the summer off and they went back in the fall. And then actually they added on a so two months in Florida, which Jonathan stayed with the show, but some other actors came in and he worked with James MacArthur, Edie Adams, Dodie Goodman, and Hans Hall um, with the actors who came in. And that last couple of months, which was an extension in Florida for the winter kind of thing. Uh, but while he was doing his uh, Arsenic on All Life's National Tour, I would look for opportunities for him to perform his one-man show in, say, a small venue on Monday night, which is night off from the tour of Arsenic and Olay. So he said, I'm going to work on Monday night. I'm doing my one man show. Um, so he was actually doing both. And he often said that was the most wonderful year of his life. He was getting to go to big cities and do Arsenic and Olay. And then he would do his one man show in smaller venues in the same town. And he just loved it. He, he always talked about how, how, how much he enjoyed that year on the road. Wow. <laughs> he was... Um, uh, I mean, as you've seen, I mean, he's, he's quite a unique character. I'm, I mean, somebody had said to me, if I had a big takeaway, you know, from this experience and really sort of delving into my past and his past, is that he had a charm about him brought on by his empathy with who he was with. You know, he would take great interest in the person he was chatting with with you know tell me about yourself and your life and that person then felt wow I'm, I'm special I'm being heard and that was the amazing part of myself and some other young people who worked with him he was a great mentor in that way as so he he said he saw potential and he supported that and um, as Will McKinley says in the document, and how valued that makes you feel. And he just had, that was just this amazing quality about him. And I think in terms of today, I would like, you know, it's sort of people should try to be that way and support young people and don't feel threatened by that person coming up, but be, be supportive. Um, and I think that's sort of the special gift that he had that I was also trying to present um, as I told his story. Yeah. So um, are you a, a, a filmmaker by trade? Is this your first uh, documentary that you've done? Or is this uh, something that kind of arise from you having worked with Jonathan Frid for so long and you want to tell his story? I actually have produced daytime television soap operas um, <laughs> my very, <laughs> for many years. Um, I worked on a soap opera. The first one was a CBS soap opera called The Guiding Light. And I began in the production office and I was working my way up towards producing. Then I went to NBC's Another World. And then I moved to ABC's One Life to Live. <laughs> then those were all in New York City. Then I moved to Los Angeles to produce General Hospital. And after that, CBS is the young and the restless. So my <laughs> life is a soap opera. Um, five daytime television soap operas where I just had an incredible experience working with incredible actors and crew and working very, very fast pace. Um, <laughs> and then <laughs> and then a few years ago with um, budget cuts and downsizing, um, I, I wasn't on a soap. And um, I was chatting with someone who said, well, you know, I know someone who might give you some money to do Jonathan Pritt's story. And I'm like, that would be incredible. <laughs> I would love to tell his story. I think in the back of my mind, I, I had thought about it, but I was so busy 
with the daytime soap schedule, we worked year round, like some 260 episodes a year. I just never would have had the time. And so I thought, okay, this is the blessing in disguise. I got let go from a show, but here's the time now and the opportunity to do the story about Jonathan. So I, yes, I have worked many, many years in daytime television soap opera, but I had never done a documentary. I had never directed. I had only produced, although I've worked with marvelous directors, um, but it really was starting from square one. All right, how do I begin to tell the story? What's my angle? I, I, I was beginning to shoot some interviews and I still was a little unclear. And then a wonderful actress who's interviewed in the documentary, um, Laura Parker, who had played this character Angelique on the original Dark Shadows. She herself is a novelist. And she said, the most important thing is to remember what's the story you're trying to tell. And I thought about it and I thought it's, it's this passion. It's his love for the stage, a passion that developed in his youth and lasted a lifetime. Uh, that was so helpful. And as I progressed, that, that little statement was always in my head and really helpful in terms of editing because I had a lot of footage. I had a great deal about his family because I spent time up in Canada talking to people. But eventually I'm like, okay, wait a minute, that gets too far off point. So it was always coming back to that line of what I had decided the story I was going to tell. Um, I learned quite a bit about uh, interviews because, again, I had never sat down and asked questions um, of certainly some well-known actresses. I think we had Christina Pickles, who's saying elsewhere. Um, I had Marion Ross from Happy Days. Um, Anthony Zerby, who's done endless episodic television, and he won an Emmy years ago for the TV series called Harry O. So they were certainly, I was impressed to meet these people, but I had very specific questions to ask. But a couple of things that came up, one, which the first interview was Marion Ross, and it was so helpful because most of these people were of a certain age. And Marion, who in fact was 91, <laughs> Um, I sat as we were preparing to go on set and said, well, let me talk to you about what type of questions I'll ask. And she said, no, absolutely not. <laughs> because she said, I will be confused when I go on camera as to what you asked me off camera and what you're asking me on camera. That was so helpful. I never occurred to me that that could be confusing for say an, an older person being into you. So I, that helped me a lot, carried, carried me through others. Also, sometimes you ask a question and the, the, the person is taking you in a direction and you really have to listen because it doesn't matter what my next question is. They may have now brought me somewhere that jumps a question I was going to ask and I should ask it now or take me somewhere I hadn't thought about. And sometimes, such as Anthony Zerby, who just was an incredible storyteller himself, he would go on and on and on again, really, really listening. Have I covered that? Or wow, you're taking me someplace I didn't expect. So I learned so much about the interview process by doing. Um, and I also um, uh, was, I had great, I had great videographers um, because when you come in and you set up, of course, I'm very focused on looking at the actor, but you also the background. And so it's super helpful to have a videographer or a cinematographer who's done it before um, that could really be helpful. And I had, because I was in different locations and you have to deal with budget, I couldn't bring, say, my Los Angeles videographer to Canada, couldn't bring my Memphis video. So every place I had to hire someone and I would try to get them potentially to email each other uh, to answer questions, uh, which was helpful. Um, and also just taking some input too from them in terms of some ideas they might have. Um, especially in Canada, I actually did some uh, filming that I, footage I never ever used, um, but it was very, it was a lot of scenic. Like we'd gone, Jonathan loved the botanical gardens in Canada and we shot a lot of stuff there. I ended never using it, as I said, but um, there was a lot of help along the way there in terms of visually. So it was a tremendous learning process, but I was having a great time. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. I was about, I was like now, I was about to ask you how much footage did you shoot versus how much archival footage you have? Because yeah. you span like his entire career mm -hmm. and there's so much footage. You, I mean, 
it had to be uh, very beneficial for them to have filmed so much stuff. <laughs> yes, I mean, it was, I mean, obviously the interviews were essential um, and some interviews were pretty concise and I could probably get it done 20, 30 minutes. Oh. But I had an interview that went on an hour and a half with one of the actors. Mm -hmm. And um, there were some really great stories that took me in all kinds of directions I didn't need. But um, I, again, I knew I captured moments. I, I, what I wanted was there. Um, I just knew in the edit, I would be going through a lot of footage. <laughs> and archival, I knew that Jonathan had done in 1960, a television version of the Shakespeare play, Henry IV, part one. And he never, he thought it was live. Well, it wasn't live, actually. It was recorded. And it was through this series. It was called Play of the Week. It was on for two seasons, 1959 to 1960, and then 1960 to 1961. And what they would do was pick a successful off-Broadway, a Broadway production, and remount it for cameras. Oh. Um, and they did have some audience. I don't know where the audience came from, but it was not done during an actual performance of the show. It was staged specifically for the cameras. Uh, David Suskind was the original producer. And I researched and found that they exist in the UCLA archives, which was just amazing. So now I found it's there, but they can't guarantee what condition it's in. <laughs> as this tape has not been taken out, it was 1960, it was on, uh, 61. So um, then that's budget money too. Um, probably the most expensive part, I think oh. of a documentary is footage, old, not the footage you shoot, mm. but the archival footage, uh, because there's rights to be paid. And so there's money to get it transferred. And again, there's no guarantee. And then when you watch it deciding, okay, how much can I buy of this footage? But the amazing thing, when I looked up Play of the Week, there's some incredible plays with actors like Robert Redford, Helen Hayes, Colleen Dewhurst, that are in these archives that have never been seen. Uh, so it was, but then absolutely wonderful to find Jonathan performing Shakespeare on stage in his prime and be able to put that in the documentary. So that was super exciting. Um, and then archive a lot of photographs, um, a lot of research with uh, university archives, um, both Canada, the United States. Um, but it, I had, it was amazing. I would get on the phone with an archivist and they'd be so happy to talk to someone about something that they, they would learning too. Like they, well, I know this in the archives, but who is he and what is this? Um, one gentleman um, in Illinois said, like, I really want to see this when it's done. They sent me a DVD. Uh, so I really, really enjoyed that whole process, too, of archival. Um, and then sometimes it is strictly, you know, look up this number and send us the number. But when I could engage with people, the librarians, it was really fun. Um, in Memphis, I was there to shoot an interview, and I had spoken to the librarian at the archives and actually went and met her and... Uh, and they, they searched and found only one photograph of this particular play. He'd been in Midsummer Night's Dream, but it was like, they said, we're gonna enhance the color for you. And they were going above and beyond to just give up their time to me. Uh, that was the thing too, again, you're always on a budget. And I would find that when I went to a place like Canada, they were letting me have space to interview people without a charge. Memphis, here, come use this theater without a charge. Wonderful people. Now, when you get to New York City, they want you to pay a lot of money. So it's like, okay, well, let me see, where can I go inexpensively? So, um, but that's the, yeah. the exact, there was an executive producer on the project and he was the one that kept me eye on the budget. And so he would say no to me a lot of times, but <laughs> that's what they do. <laughs> Oh, say no to you when you want to just be able to go out there and shoot the movie that you want to shoot and get the footage that you want to get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so how long did it take you to put this whole film together from when you started when you started it to when it, 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 it uh, when you got the, the first version that you screened? How, what was the process like? So um, the first step was, of course, figuring out um, I was kind of simultaneously doing archival uh, research and then re figuring out who I wanted to interview. I mean, many people I'd like to talk to sadly have passed away already. Um, I, I had met a number of Jonathan's friends um, and knew certain actors he'd worked with, but they weren't here anymore. So then when I make that list and then contacting through a publicist or an agent, um, getting that all set up. So it was kind of simultaneously, but um, the bulk of the work was two and two and a half years. Um, 
I, uh, if you start to include like now that, you know, after distribution, but, um, but it really was, yeah, very intense. I, um, my editor, of course, also we were going COVID. Yeah, thankfully I did all my interviews and suddenly COVID hit. Oh. And um, cause my last interview was end of January and then beginning of March <laughs> 2020 with COVID. And, um, and even the archive the archives were closing because many of them affiliated with universities and they were shutting down because of COVID. Oh. So I had most things, but again, there were a few that I needed. And I said, okay, I'm, as soon as things get reopened, which was longer than I thought, um, but I was eventually able to get everything that I needed together. Um, so it was sent. Um, so I had a distributor lined up, actually, the company that has the rights to Dark Shadows, the episodes, and they originally put them on VHS, and then they put them on DVD, and then Blu-ray. So they were the ones interested in putting money behind this project. Um, nice. MPI actually is interesting trivia. Um, Muhammad Ali's brother, um, it was the one who started MPI um, and uh, the family, the Ali family still runs this business. And so I thought, oh, interesting. They have a documentary coming out and um, about Muhammad Ali and here's his family. Um, they were, you know, basically um, the executive producer was the one that talked to them and, you know, said, okay, this is the, <laughs> they kept saying, this is the budget. This is the, what we want to work within. But it was, it, it was great to know that they were there and their intention was always to put it on streaming service and mm -hmm. do DVD and Blu-ray as well. Uh, so, um, so it's been great to, to, ha to already know that was in place because so much of for filmmakers starting, it's like, how am I going to get this out there? Who will become yeah. a distributor? Um, which is why many people go into film festivals is to get the distributor. I, I was blessed in that I already had that in place, um, but you still, you know, you're trying to do the best product possible and get as much publicity as you can. Um, because today there's so many, as you know, there's so many streaming services with so much to watch. You just kind of have to keep saying, hey, I'm over here. I think you really like this. Please watch my movie. <laughs> You are absolutely correct. Uh, until uh, you submitted your film, <clears throat> I didn't even know it exists. I was like, there's a film about Jonathan Frid out there and I did not know about it? How did this happen? And then, of course, you said to me, I was like, oh, this, oh, I, get, I, got, I have to watch this. I have to watch this. If, if for no other reason that, uh, like I said, my mother got me into the whole horror thing and uh, Dark Shadows and uh, it kind of grew from there because now I'm at my other our other film festival that we do caters towards sci-fi, horror, and fantasy. And then, of course, you know, it, it all started from my my mother's love of this stuff, and she passes it off to me. And oh, I don't know if my, I'm gonna pass it off to my son, but you know, each new generation is gonna watch it. And that's one of the things about Dark Shadows. It's transcended multiple different generations of people. People just keep Absolutely. watching the original version, not because it's campy, because I, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm like in the film with the cast of the original cast who did look down on Tim Burton's version because they played it for camp. And the original Dark Shadows and even the, the TV, the 90s revival were not campy. They, they might be camping to you now because of the aesthetics back then are not the same as now, but they weren't camping back then. It may have been a soap opera, but people were really into these stories. And these actors did a tremendous job in conveying these, oh, I, I don't want to say horrific type of characters, but these are characters who wouldn't be typically seen in a soap opera. And people well, that's what it was. It, it truly was. It, it was unique. It was gothic, gothic soap opera. The only yeah. gothic soap opera that's existed. Um, and originally, Dan Curtis was thinking of it as a nighttime show. And then ABC said, "Well, we need to improve our daytime lineup. Come on in to do daytime." But they took classic horror stories, Frankenstein, mm -hmm. um, the, the gothic romance like *Wuthering Heights*, *Jane Eyre*. Uh, Jekyll and Hyde, Turn of the Screw, yeah. all those classic stories were taken to create the storylines on Dark Shadows and, of course, Dracula. Um, <laughs> and Dan Curtis loved, he loved horror growing up. I mean, yeah. like you said, too, he was introduced to it and he loved to be scared. And so he thought, ah, that's what I want to create the show about. 
Um, and I think that's why it transcends today. It continues because it's classic stories of Gothic romance, Gothic horror, and people are drawn to that. And as you've said, the actors were classically trained and they took it very seriously. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a joke and they really sold the story. I mean, you really felt for these characters. I mean, Jonathan was the first time a vampire because the Bella Lugosi, if people remember, was a monster. And Jonathan, as an actor, when he was cast in the role of a villain, he always looked for the other side. He said, the villain isn't all dark. It, it's a mixture in there of, of good and evil. And in case of the vampire, he didn't want to be a vampire. He was cursed. And to survive, he had to bite a woman's neck and suck her blood, but he didn't want to. And so he often felt guilty. So the audience empathized, oh, we feel so bad, this poor guy and his vulnerability came across the screen. And so, you know, women just loved his character, uh, whether they wanted to mother him or be with him. And it was at the time a very unique position for the character of a vampire. And it's really what carried all these years later into the twilights. And, that it was the vulnerable vampire that people now were drawn to. Um, and he was the start really back then. And maybe there'll be a new Dark Shadows um, showrunner, Mark Perry, who's done a number of show, most recently Supernatural. Um, and he has a pilot script for a new Dark Shadows and he's pitching it. So hopefully that will happen. <laughs> yes, I, 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 I'd be excited. I know my son will probably be excited too. We'll be sitting down here watching it. And then I'll have to go back and say, you know where this started? This started back in the, as a soap opera back in, you know, the 50s and 60s. And, you know, your, your, your grandmother watched it, your father watched it. And now it's time for you to watch it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'd like to ask you, um, uh, one of the, well, this might not be my final question, but uh, what is uh, one of the things you'd like people to take away from, from your film after watching it? Well, one of the reviewers said a very nice thing that it was a wonderful story about an actor and it didn't involve a scandal. <laughs> um, I think today, you know, we, we often watch a documentary about a celebrity's life and there's a darker side or they have to, you have to hear about some salacious thing that happened, but, but the documentary doesn't doesn't need to have that. And in, in Jonathan's life, he really was a real good hearted man. I mean, in many ways, he was kind of a an old fashioned gentleman. I mean, he was raised in Canada in a sort of a Victorian environment. So in some ways, there was a relatability to the character of, of Barnabas. Um, and I think it's wonderful to look at somebody as a mentor. He loved to mentor young people. He was terrific with his fans. He appreciated them for watching the show. And he would, no matter how tired he was after doing his one man show, he would stand outside, he would sign autographs, he'd post for pictures, always. There was never a time he said, I'm, not, I'm gonna ignore them. He, he would go out, um, Q and A sessions, and he really wanted to let them know, to say thank you and gratitude. It was a man full of gratitude, generosity, um, and I think we could use that in the world today. <laughs> so I think that the takeaway is here's somebody who, who gave a lot and maybe in our own lives, we should look about where we could help or be a mentor to others. Nice. Yeah. So, well, that is a great way to end our conversation uh, because uh, one of the things I always like to ask uh, filmmakers is, in the event that, uh, you know, you get a big audience and they, they sometimes may not always get that little, that little oomph that you want as a filmmaker to, uh, after watching your film, I always like to ask filmmakers what they really want audiences to take away from it. And that, you're, you're right, Jonathan Frid's uh, life and this movie do not have any of that, that controversy that, has, that, that plagues a lot of films nowadays about celebrities. <laughs> Uh, I think it's uh, it's it's got, it's one of those things where people think that you can't do a movie about a celebrity unless there is some type of controversy surrounded in their lives. And it's refreshing uh, yeah. to see that um, there is none of that with him and with his life. Mm -hmm. 
Right. It's, it's as as this one reviewer so happily put as you just did. It's a nice change of pace yeah. to not have to have that to to really um, see somebody that you can admire um, for the type of, of man he was and and actually you know quite humble about this too. I mean he wasn't out there raising a flag like oh I'm giving all my money to charity. You know um, he was very very quiet and, and private about that. Um, and I really want to be for people to see you know, this is a. Yeah, this man was really very, very, very kind-hearted. Well, it has been a pleasure talking to you about uh, you, you, your film, and especially Jonathan Frid. Uh, like I said, I now know a whole heck of a lot more now than I ever did. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I hope that the people watching the film at our film festival, at the other film festivals the film goes to, and uh, now that it has its streaming, and it's, I hope it reaches a really big audience, but not just that, it reaches the fans uh, as much as it should. Um, Cause I know in the film you mentioned that you mentioned the, the um, Dark Shadows convention and stuff like that. So there, there's a huge amount of people out there who probably don't know nearly as much about uh, Frid as you have demonstrated in this film. So I'm, I'm hoping that it reaches all of them because not just him, but Dark Shadows had a, a huge, profound effect on people. Still has a profound effect on people, and this just shows you how much of um, a, a professional and what a type of man uh, Jonathan Frid was, you know, prior to his passing. So, yeah. thank you yeah. so much. Oh, you're very welcome, Philip. Thank you for inviting me to be a filmmaker, <laughs> inter doing a filmmaker interview. Uh, for something wicked doc fest i really i really enjoyed it thank you you're welcome so uh like i said i wish the film luck in uh the the rest of its festival run you've already got a distributor in place so you're good there <laughs> uh, so have a good evening and uh, i look forward to uh another film from you if you decide to do another one i would i would like to work on some other ideas thank you excellent <laughs> all right bye-bye Thank you.